morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Hope everyone is having a fantastic morning so far. My name is Roger. I'm going to be your host for today. Before we get started with today's service, I want to go ahead and let you know that we are having our sizzling summer Sunday today. It's going to be taking place right after church today. We're going to be playing games, eating, and simply having fun. Be sure to stick around afterwards. If we have any newcomers out there today or online, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Please make your way to our resource table. It's going to be located in the back of the room. Go ahead and fill out a connect card for us. The reason why we ask this is because we want to stay in contact with you, help you with your walk with God, and to simply answer any questions that you might have for us. And we have a little gift. It's going to be a copy of the book called Gentle and Lowly. It's a great read. You're going to love it. Don't forget to pick one up on your way out today. Now, let's get ready for worship. Let's all rise and sing, Bless the Lord.
let's continue to worship the Lord here. How great is our God. church. I'm out of breath. I'm getting old. I'm old, should I say. It's good to see everybody here today. We're going to continue singing here in just one second. Why don't you go ahead and sit down just for a second. I'm only going to take 25 minutes here. Are you hungry? Is anybody hungry? And we got hot dogs and fruit and a lot more coming after this but are you hungry spiritually are you hungry for the spiritual new of god's promises you know when athletes want to move to the next level the coach asks are you hungry how hungry are you how bad do you want this 
One way doctors determine the health of an individual is related to appetite. Well, I must be healthy because I'm always getting appetite. The loss of desire of food is an indication that something deeper is wrong. With that in mind, have we lost perhaps something else we need desperately every single day? Have we lost our spiritual appetite? Are we hungry? How then do we explain Christians who have no spiritual appetite, who don't have a hunger for God? Hunger is the prerequisite for spiritual passion. Perhaps our problem today is that we're not really hungry yet. Why? We aren't desperate because when we get hungry, we take desperate measures and you don't care who's watching. For instance, instance in the scriptures Zacharias he didn't care that the crowd watched him climb a tree the hunger hungrier for God you are the more intense intimate intimate excuse me start over the hunger for God you are the more intimate you are with him the more intimate you are with him the more capacity you have and the more capacity you have the more power and passion you can experience with God. So church, are we hungry? Are we truly hungry for God? Seeking him out constantly as we worship, as we listen to the preaching of the word, as we dig into the scriptures of the Bible, are we truly hungry? This song talks about the hunger of the Lord. And we ask that you would please think about this as we sing it together. Stand again, please, and join us as we sing Hungry.
Hey, thanks worship team. That was beautiful. Go ahead and take your seats. My name is Pastor Dave Lanto. I'm the lead pastor here at Victory. We're so glad everybody's here today online and in person. It's going to be a great Sunday together. Will you, will you join me in prayer right now? Our God and our Father, we just want to come before you right now. Because, Lord, I just know we need you in our lives, Jesus. We need you. Jesus, some of us are hurting financially. Some folks are going through some things physically with their health. There's some folks who need a job. Lord, I pray that you would meet us right where we are. We came to the right place because we're seeking you, Jesus, the one who brings answers, the one who provides the breakthrough that we need in our lives. And I pray right now that as we get into your word, that you would open our hearts, open our lives, that we'd be able to receive this message from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're, we're in the midst of a series. It's called On Purpose. And in this series, we're journeying through the book of Mark, and we're looking at little snippets from Jesus' life and ministry, and we're seeing how he stayed on track no matter what was going on in his life. External situations and circumstances, distractions from people, nobody got in the way of Jesus getting to his purpose. And so we're looking at several themes throughout, and today we're going to focus on the theme of vision. This message is called Getting In on the Vision. And vision is the kind of thing that we can talk about it two ways. You have a vision for your life. Where's, what's the direction of your life? Where is your life headed toward? What, what, is the, what is the thing that God's working on you and calling you to? But then we can look at vision as something that we get on board with others. We can talk about a vision for our country. It's an election year. And so we, you know, we get all hyped up about, about political candidates. And the news is talking about it every day. And, and you go, each candidate, you're looking for, one of the things you want to look for, do they have a vision? What is their vision for the country? And am I on board with that vision? Well, vision is the kind of thing that a church needs to be about. We need to have a vision as a church, as God's people. And, and, and so today we're going to focus in on this, this, this theme of getting in on the vision. And... I wanted to share with you a little story to get started. So there's a golfer whose bad shot wound up on a big anthill. So he squared up. He took a big swing, and he missed. Thousands of innocent ants were killed. The golfer took another swing. He missed again. Another wave of ants were destroyed. Finally, this one ant, this one little ant, rises up. He says, hey, listen to me. Talks to all the other ants. He speaks with authority. And another ant said, and he goes, listen to me. Let's go. Follow me. And the other ant goes, where are we going? He points to the golf ball in front of them. And he says, we need to get on the ball or we're dead. Vision is like that. We need to get on the ball with vision for our lives or we're dead. You know, the scripture, it says in the book of Proverbs 28, verse 18, without vision, people perish. And the thinking about that is that our lives are meant to have a vision, something that is a target in front of us that we're aiming for, the overall of our lives that we're aiming for. And if we don't have that, we kind of feel like we're floundering around. If we don't have a vision, it feels like we're just like, circumstances are just kind of distracting us or moving us, and we're just going, man, I just feel lost. I feel like there's no direction for my life. Maybe you've felt like that at different times. I don't have a direction for my life. 
I don't have a vision for my life. And I just want you to know, we're going to explore this theme today, and I want you to know that God has a vision for you, and your life vision is important. And, and, and collectively, we have, is making this our church, God has a vision for us to make an impact in our community. Where there's a church in a community, a church is meant to make a difference in people's lives, where people can find hope. And we live in a world where people need hope. Have you noticed that? People need hope. So we're going to go ahead and, and start and get right into the Scripture. We're looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8 today. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole, the whole thing, and then I'm going to break it down. Starting in verse 2 of Mark chapter 9. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Verse 5. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 6. And he did not know, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but only Jesus. Today I want to share with you four ideas about vision. Four ideas about vision that you can grab hold of that we see in this scripture. And the first of these four ideas is selection. Selection. Not everyone can come along because they're not always ready. They're not ready for what God has for them. There are times in your life that you may not be ready to receive what God wants to give to you. So he withholds it because you're not ready. And, and, and there's a point where your readiness needs to meet the opportunity. There's things that we can do to make sure that we prepare ourselves to receive from heaven what God wants for us. And Jesus took with him these three disciples. He took Peter, James, and John from among the twelve. But remember, at this time, he had many more than twelve disciples. He had hundreds and hundreds of disciples. But the closest were the twelve, and among the twelve, Peter, James, and John. He took them to reveal something that he thought they were ready for. This, is, this, this episode in Jesus' life is called the transfiguration. And it's where Jesus is sort of transformed, where they see Jesus not... They're always used to seeing Jesus as a man, but remember, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. Amen. It wasn't 50% man and 50% God. He was 100 of both. And at this moment, Jesus revealed his godly nature to these three disciples. And when he revealed himself, he only revealed it to these three. And we get a glimpse from Jesus, what he did here, something that is an important thing for leaders to do, that they need to select those who are ready to go into new territory. Because not everybody's ready. And, and, and mostly the readiness depends on each person. You have control of your own readiness. And the scripture says that in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart of a person. 
God looks on our heart and sees the condition of our heart. And that's the most important thing to God. I would hope, I'll, I'll, this is a side note, I would hope that in this space where God's people gather together, that no one's outward appearance ever matters. You know, I have a friend, and I coach him and kind of help him achieve some goals in his life. And one of the things that's going on is he, he's really let himself go. He's, he's way overweight, and he's trying to lose weight, and he's taking steps to get his life better. And I was talking with him this past week, and one of the things is that he, him and his wife both have this problem, and they had started or stopped going to church in person. They're believers, and they stopped going to their church in person. And they started during COVID only doing online services. Hey there, online crowd. We love you guys. They started only doing online services because they didn't want to go. It was easier, and they didn't want to go in person, and they, they're so overweight, and they feel he feels especially like people are pointing at him or laughing at him or going to judge him. And so he stopped going to church service. So, so one of the things that, 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 that we, we agreed was one of his goals, that he wanted to go to church in person. And then he started going. And I was talking with him this past week, and I said, what, tell me some of the wins that you've had this week. And he said, I, I went to church service. And, 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 and I asked him, I said, where did you feel confident in yourself? And he said, when I went to church service. And I asked him why he felt confident. And he said, because nobody judged me. Nobody judged me. I was able to talk with people. If I, he goes, he wants to get to the gym. He goes, that's the biggest barrier, getting to the gym. He goes, I feel like I'm going to be judged like crazy at the gym. He doesn't go to restaurants because the seating, he's got a bad knee. The seatings are usually too low. He has to kind of push himself up, and he doesn't want to go through the awkwardness of that. And, but something powerful, I thought, when he said he felt confident in himself when he went to church service because he wasn't judged by anyone. People were glad to see him, giving him a hug, slapping him a high five, saying, we're glad you're here. That's what church is supposed to be like. Where, you know that, remember that, that, that show that used to be on if you're, you're dating yourself, Cheers? Who knows Cheers, the show? You, you show you, that you're, you grew up in the 80s or something like that, from, if you know Cheers. But that, that song, remember that song? You want to go to the place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. That's supposed to be church. We're, we, we're meant to be like that. Church should always be that place where we're welcoming people. We're always glad where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. So Jesus selected these three and those closest disciples, but I want to point out that Jesus did not choose them because they were the most qualified. Jesus did not choose them because they had the best resume. Jesus did not choose Peter, James, and John because they had the most experience with God or the best education or the best jobs or were the wealthiest or the best reputation in the community. He didn't choose them for any of those things. He didn't choose them because they were the most qualified. There's a reality that God qualifies those he calls. When he calls you, it's your responsibility to go. God will qualify you. God will prepare you. God will elevate you. But trust him enough to go. I mean a lot of people that, that they say that yeah, they can't go to church because they feel like that they're not good enough. And there's always a conversation that, 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 I, that I have when I have that kind of a conversation with somebody and I start thinking like, here's the thing. When it's time to go take a shower, do you go, well, I need to go get cleaned up before I take a shower? No. That would be absurd. Why? Just get in the shower and get cleaned. Just come to God. God will take care of it. 
the church is welcome for everybody. That's how church is meant to be. Now, the Lord is working in each of our lives, and He wants to prepare us for what He has for us, for our calling. Don't stress if you're, you don't feel ready or you don't feel qualified or you don't feel like you have it all together, or you're not good enough. The best time to prepare yourself in the ways that you could prepare yourself was yesterday. But the second best time to prepare yourself is today, right now. Get started now. Seek God. Become the right person before the opportunity shows up. God's going to do great things in your life. So selection is this first thing that we see with Jesus. You know, God gives certain creatures in the world. We were at the zoo yesterday, at the L.A. Zoo, and we were just marveling at Every time I go to the zoo or a marine place where you see all the animals and the fish and you see how the diversity of how God creates animals. And there are certain creatures that he makes with amazing capabilities. The chameleon, for example, shows this uncanny accuracy with catching bugs with its tongue. It catches its food with its tongue really well. And as researchers have studied chameleons in particular, they discovered something that chameleons have that's different from every other animal on the planet. They found out that chameleons have telephoto eyes. That means that they can see in black and white and in color. Most animals, it's, they only see in color. But chameleons have this, this other ability to see in black and white, and it makes their ability to see sharper than all the other animals. And so these lizards have their eyes that work like a telephoto lens on a camera that helps them zoom in on their target and see exactly uh, what they want to see with amazing accuracy. And, you know, I, I think that that's, that's really something because that extra tool that God gave them empowers them for what they need to do, empowers them to live life well. And for us, being able to see clearly what we're aiming for is super important. So vision kind of talks about being able to see maybe what others don't see. You see, with a vision for your life, with a vision that you're jumping on board, maybe others go, it's like, you know those renovation shows that they, where they take a an old house and they fix it up? Most people, when they see a, 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 a ripped apart house that's the worst house on the block, they go, that house is hopeless. It needs a match. But to the one who can renovate it, they see a vision for what that house can be that's nowhere near what it is at that moment. But they see it. And then they, 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 they begin working on that house, acquiring the tools, acquiring the, 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 the parts to renovate that house, tearing down a wall here, building a new space there. And they create something that they saw in their minds because they had a vision for it. That's the kind of vision we're talking about. Seeing what other people don't see. When Jesus appeared to Peter, James, and John, when he showed them himself, his, his heavenly version of himself, the full God in him, he was calling them to this next thing about vision. The second part about vision is higher. When you're ready, Christ will take you higher. In, in verse 2, it says that Jesus led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Two of the barriers that keep us from reaching our God-given potential is one that we place too little weight on our gifts but two, that we pay, place too much weight on our failures. 
We, we need to be able to recognize that. We have gifts. Each one of us has gifts. You have gifts that I don't have and the person next to you doesn't have. In fact, they need to know that they have some gifts. Turn to somebody and tell them, you've got some gifts. They need to know. You need to know. You've got some gifts. Value your gift. Let others see your gifts in action so you can shine. That's how you shine, by exercising your gifts. In Bruce Wilkinson's book, The Dream Giver, great little book, it tells the story of nobody who wanted to be somebody. And he had a dream. And he talks about that when you first enter the sanctuary of God, he invites you to leave behind the dirt and the hurt of the wasteland to come to the water. God always invites you to come to the water. That's why Jesus said, he said, come follow me. And he goes, and he goes springs of living water are going to burst out of you. And as believers... When we first come to faith, the, the, the very next thing that we want to be able to do is go to the waters of baptism. Baptism is a symbol. It's a picture of a reality, a miracle that takes place when God restores us, when God renews us. And so we do this picture of, with baptism where we go under the water, and it's like when Jesus was buried after he died. But when we come out of the water, it's like raising from the dead. You're born into new life. And that's why baptism is a huge deal. It's a picture of this thing. And if you haven't been baptized, make sure you get a, put a response card and let us know that you want to be baptized and we'll, we'll, we can arrange for your baptism. But... Jesus calls us to come to the waters where, where, where it's a picture of our sins being washed away. We, in fact, we, we, there's, a, there's an old song that we sing, have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus' blood cleanses us from sin. And we need the cleansing that comes from Jesus. The waters of restoration prepare us for what's to come next. God will then invite you to come closer with Him. He invites you to come into the light. Come into the light. As you seek God, the Lord, after you've come to the water, the Lord will say, come into the light. And you've heard me say this before, that there, 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 there are these dramatic pictures that two different kinds of bugs have to the light. In the dark, the cockroaches come out. They come over and they, get, they pick at the food and they, they look for the food and those cockroaches are gross and disgusting and you hate having cockroaches in your house. And when, you, when, you, when you're able to, to kill one of them, they splat all over the place and it's super disgusting. Cockroaches, when you turn on the light, what do they do? They run from the light. They want to be in the darkness. But moths, what do moths do? They fly toward the light. They want to be near the light. They're drawn to the light. And Jesus draws us to come into the light to be like moths. Don't be like cockroaches. The evil ones are drawn to the darkness. The good ones are drawn to the light. Go out into the light. Come into the light. When your relationship with God deepens into a genuine trust in His character, you'll be ready for the final invitation that God gives you. It's to come higher now. Come higher now. Higher ground is where we meet God. When, when, when Peter, James, and John, when they went with Jesus, they said they went to a high mountain. Come higher. He invited them to come higher because they were ready to receive it. 
when we come higher with God, He gives us these glimpses into His character and into His godliness and into the kind of life that we're born to receive from Him. And there's another message that you need to tell someone else about yourself right now. Tell them, I want to go higher. Tell someone right now. Say it and seek it. God will ask you to consecrate yourself to Him, to set your life apart, to go seek Him. And we do need to surrender to God, where we surrender like, God, I'm seeking you. I'm done seeking my will. I'm going to seek your will. Not my will, but thine be done, but yours be done. When we surrender our dream, then he can enlarge our lives with his vision for us. And God will always, God doesn't call you to a smaller life. God calls you to a bigger life. God enlarges your vision. The third, the third trait or the third idea about vision I want to share with you is honor. Honor. After you've gone higher with the Lord, you'll learn to honor those who are on your side. You know, what does it say that Peter, James, and John, when they saw, they, say, they saw this miraculous thing that Jesus is transformed in front of their faces. He's bright, shining. And he's talking with Moses and Elijah. Moses, who led Israel out of slavery in Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, did all these miracles. And led God's people. Elijah, the prophet of God who spoke boldly the message that God wanted him to to speak to the people. And did tons of miracles. One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Elijah. Jesus is with them. And Peter, it tells us that Peter is kind of blown away. He goes, Lord, it's good that we're here with all of you. And we want to build these tabernacle, these little tents, for one for each of you. And it says, for he didn't know what to say because he was terrified. Peter's the one who spoke. They were all terrified. They're going, Jesus was accessible to us, but like, what is happening in here now? They're blown away. They're terrified. And they want to honor Jesus. They want to find a way to honor him. Pride keeps us from giving honor where honor is due. Pride keeps us. But once pride is in check, we're free to honor God and to honor our teachers and those who sacrifice to help us get where we need to go. The person who can put aside their pride to honor others who deserve it becomes worthy of honor themselves. We need to be able to honor those in our lives who are important to us. Peter recognized that he was in the presence of greatness with Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And he sought to honor these great men and God himself, Jesus. The only way he knew how to build something. It takes humility to recognize God's hand on another person. But you'll see there are people in your life like, wow, God's working through my wife or my husband or my child or my dad, my mom, my friend, my boss. When you recognize God working in someone's life, find ways to honor them. Honor those who are with you. When humility is cultivated within us, we're able to honor other people. And we see this glimpse of Visionaries can honor other people. And the last of the four words is revealed. Revealed. When God reveals something to you, it's your moral obligation to act on it. One of the biggest barriers to experiencing God is our refusal to take action. 
We need to take uncomfortable action in our lives as we follow God. All the time, every day, this week, for the vision God has for you, you've got to take uncomfortable action. Prepare when nobody's looking. Study the Word. Pray. Meet with God's people. Fellowship with the Lord's people. Develop your, your skills, your traits, your understanding. Always growing. God gave you this capacity to be a lifelong learner. Be learning every day. Learn from good experiences and bad experiences. So in verse 7, it says that a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. God broke open the skies and spoke to Peter, James, and John, just to them, reached into the world just to speak to the three of them and said, this right here is my son. Listen to what he has to say. The idea that he said, this is my beloved son is important. Even God knows how to honor his son. A father needs to be able to honor his children. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved child. God models good parenting right there. He's not saying, oh, my son's just a kid. Don't listen to what he has to say. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Have you heard some parents talk like that about their kids? I have. Maybe that's their kids. But every child has a capacity to grow and to become someone great. And in Christ's name, we're all meant to experience that kind of greatness that comes from God. So, when God reveals something to you, don't sit on it. Don't be silent. Don't go, well, I don't know what I should do. Obey what God said to do. Do exactly what he says to do. His word is our command. We're like soldiers in God's army. If, if a soldier, when it's time to go into battle, and the sergeant's leading them out to battle, when they're going out and following their leaders, if there's a soldier who says, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling it today. I'm not feeling like going into battle today. That's not a good soldier. You can't have an army with soldiers like that. That soldier needs to be disciplined. That soldier went through basic training to learn to follow orders. We're in God's army. And if we can't follow our orders, we need to go back to basic training. We need to be disciplined. We need to be able to follow what God is doing, saying to us in our lives. God the Father is saying, listen to Jesus. I want to reveal, I want to show you. I just took a handful of Jesus' commands from Scripture. And I'm just going to walk right through them real quick. I'm not going to expand on them. I'm going to give them to you real quick. Ten commands of Jesus. First, Jesus said in, if you hit that next slide, ten commands of Jesus. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near in Matthew 4.17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent means walk away from the way that you've been going and walk toward God. Turn away from the way that you've been going and go the way that God wants you to go. Stop going in the direction you're going that's leading you away from God. Turn around and go toward God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus also said, come and follow me in Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said, come and follow me. He didn't say, follow yourself. He didn't say, you're the boss. He said, come follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, go all in with following Jesus. He's our leader. He's our savior. He's our master. When he says go, we go. When he says do, we do. When he calls us to a vision, that's our vision for life. Jesus said, let your light shine before all people. In Matthew 5, 16. You've got gifts, you've got a personality, you've got commitment to the Lord, let 
it shine before men and women in this world. Let your light shine. Don't be afraid to let your light shine. Don't fade into the corner. Don't hide yourself. Don't, I know that it's for some, for some of us who are introverts, we don't want to be seen. We'd rather hide. We don't want to talk to anyone. But your light needs to shine in your life. And it's going to stretch you to shine your light. No matter what kind of personality you have, when you let your light shine, it's going to stretch you. Jesus said, be reconciled to one another, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. You know what that means? That when you're at odds with somebody, when you're in a fight with someone, when you're angry with someone, when you've had a disagreement with someone, be reconciled with them. Seek reconciliation. Seek to make it right. Go to them with an olive branch of peace and try to make it right. They might not receive you. You can't control that part. But for your part, call them up and go, you know what? I don't even remember what we were fighting over, but I just want to say I miss you. I love you. I want to be reconciled with you. Put your pride aside and seek reconciliation. Jesus said, moving on, the next five. Jesus said, take sin very seriously. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Take sin very seriously. Don't let sin be something that you just go, well, you know, it's just me. That's just the way I am. When you sin, don't let your sin come between you and God. When you sin, ask God for forgiveness right away. When you sin against another person, that's a violation. Sin is a violation on another person. Sin is a violation to God. When you violated another person, you go seek to make it right. Sin is serious. It's a violation on another person. Jesus also said, keep your word, Matthew 5, 37. We need to be people who if we said it, then we need to do it. We need to keep our word. We need to be people that are trustworthy. As we keep our word over and over, we earn people's trust. Jesus also said, remember, the Lord said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 5, 39, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. That's when someone abuses you. When someone abuses you, be the kind of person that turns the other cheek. You're not looking to, to go get even. You're going to turn the other cheek. And let God take care of it. Turning the other cheek means if they slap you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek and you let them slap you on that cheek too. And then let God take care of it. Man, this is not the way of the world. This is not the way of our personality where we want to go. Somebody does something to us, we want to go get even with them. But Jesus called us to a different way and yet was on purpose. He didn't call us to be weak. In fact, it takes the strongest person to be able to turn the other cheek. It takes the strongest person in the world to be able to say, you're abusing me. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to turn the other cheek. They can abuse me all they want. And then let God deal with the results because he will if you'll trust him. Because what happens is you're going to wind up winning that person over in the name of Jesus. That's why Jesus gave us that way. Jesus also said, go above and beyond in Matthew 5, 40 and 40 through 42. Don't just do the bare minimum to get by. Be people who go over and above. Most people, you, you, you know this, you've done this, we've all done this at times. We're like, ah, that's good enough. Good enough for who? We know that Paul wrote in Colossians, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Is it good enough for God? If you're doing that for God, whatever you're doing, we should never say that's good enough. 
We need to bring a level of excellence to everything we do that makes it matter, that makes it worthy of the Lord God in heaven, that makes it worthy of Jesus. I'll give you one more, maybe the hardest one of all. Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. What does love do? Love is not a feeling. The world says love is a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is action. Love is a verb. Love takes action to do specific things. Love protects and love provides for. Protect your enemy. Provide for your enemy. Care for your enemy. That's what love does. Jesus called us to that for our enemies. That's harsh. That's harsh. But again, Jesus knew why he did it. He did it because that's the kind of life we're meant to live. And by living that kind of life, that's the only way that we will be a strong witness for Jesus in a world that's so full of hate, in a world that's full of getting even, in a world that's full of vengeance, in a world that is evil. Jesus calls us to love those who are evil against us. And so I want to draw us to a point of closure in prayer right now. Because we believe that as we hear from the Word of God, which we've just heard from, it's our duty to respond. And, and there's probably some things in this message for all of us about the vision that we're meant for the vision for our lives because the commands of Jesus are a vision for a certain kind of way of life. That's not a human way. It's a Jesus way. And Jesus calls us to it. And as we begin to seek Him, He does amazing things in our lives. So I want to just draw you to a point of prayer with me. Will you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we thank You for Your goodness and your love. We thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus, your son, to the cross for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you were obedient to the cross, and we have the cleansing waters of life with you, Jesus. We have the life that we can come into the light. We have the life that we can come higher. Lord, I pray that you would in our lives, draw us close to you. I want more of you in my life, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place and I pray that you would help us to seek you in your ways even now. Maybe there's someone in the hearing of this message that you haven't yet walked across the line of faith to put your faith in Jesus. And I just want to give you that quick opportunity right now. Right where you're sitting, right where you are, you can put your faith in Jesus by acknowledging Him. In your own words, in the quietness of your heart, let Him know, Jesus, I want you in my life. Jesus, I need you in my life. Will you be my Savior? Will you cleanse me from my sin? Lord, I give my life to you. Jesus, I give my life to you. Amen. Will you rise as we sing?
Thank you, worship team. If anyone today has put their faith in Jesus, congratulations and welcome to the faith. Send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org. We want to hear from you, celebrate with you, and help you take your next steps in following Jesus. You can also mention this on your connect cards before you turn them in. Don't forget to do that. Here at Victory, we invite everyone to give. We practice the tithe, which is 10% back to God. You can give in two ways. One, you can use our secured online platform. It's going to be at victoryanaheim.org slash donate. Or you can use our giving box. It's going to be located in the back of the room. God bless you as you give. A couple of announcements for today. A little reminder, we are having our sizzling summer Sunday right after church. Be sure to stick around for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Next, take the 90-day giving challenge. You can do this by filling it out on your card and turning it in at the resource table. At the resource table, you're going to find all the information that you need and to pick up a copy of the treasured principle. For the last one, our Labor Day picnic, can't forget about that. Go ahead and mark it out on your calendars for September 2nd, Monday at 11 a.m. It's going to be a lot of fun. I encourage everyone to come, even if you're new here. It's going to be at Clark Regional Park. Address is going to be on the screen at 88 or not, <laughs> at 8800 Rosecrans Avenue, Buena Park. Go to the resource table before you leave here today and fill out a main dish, a side dish, snacks, or any desserts that you want to bring. And let's go ahead and sing once more. <laughs> 